The panel has to do with the future of artificial intelligence, which is truly one of the most exciting uh, issues out there. And to lead this panel, I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Vijay Vaitiswaran. He is a author of a famous book dealing with global innovation with a fantastic title entitled Need, Speed, and Greed. And today he's becoming the US business editor of The Economist. Mr. Vaitiswaran, please. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a great honor to be here, uh, although it's a tough act to follow after that lunch presentation, I must say. Uh, but I'm delighted to say I have uh, two great stars uh, in the field of artificial intelligence that are going to light up our stage here as well to keep the, the day going. Uh, we're going to talk about blended reality, which is a way of thinking about cognitive computing in the age of artificial intelligence. Uh, to help us with this, I'm going to invite on stage uh, uh, Tommy Poggio, who is a board member at Mobileye and a director of Center for Brains, Minds, and Machines at MIT, my alma mater. I'm very honored to have you here, sir. Please join us. Welcome. And Jack Hittery, senior advisor to Alphabet X Labs, uh, also uh, who's trained in neuroscience at NIH, a serial entrepreneur, and something he calls a quantum magician, which we, we might hear a little bit about. Please welcome Jack. So I think we're going to hear a, a few initial uh, comments from both of them before we can uh, delve right into it. So Tommy, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll speak briefly about uh, um, where AI is going. And uh, I will start with a little bit of history. So um, you know, there was in the description of this panel that we are at, at just dealing with the fourth industrial revolution. I'm not sure about whether that's true or not, but I can tell you what is my view as a scientist. Um, you know, the great revolution that started the age of computer science is really electricity. That's 1800, Alessandro Volta in Pavia. Just to give you an idea of the times, he was made a count by Napoleon. And uh, at the time, information was traveling with the speed of a horse. Um, you know, 24 hours. There are beautiful letters uh, from 1550 or so when Constantinopolis fell to the Turks, in which people in Vienna and Paris and Madrid wrote to each other, did you hear, I heard that Constantinopolis fell to the Turks. And Vienna was three months, uh, three weeks, Paris was four, Madrid was five, with the speed of a horse. So Volta invents the first continuous source of electricity. And after that, the telegraph, electric motors, lights, everything follows in a span of less than a century. Um, and from the point of view of science, um, you can see that the first half of last century was really physics, it was Einstein and Heisenberg and Bohr, Max Planck. The second half of last century was molecular biology, what Watson and Crick and all the um, molecular biology offsprings in terms of companies. Um, the first half of this century is likely to be deep learning or learning, machine learning and AI. Um, the machine learning has been um, starting with um, artificial intelligence in the 60s and then uh, really took off in 2010 or so when it became, uh, started to become from such just a, a subject for academic research, started to become uh, real and affecting our lives. Um, you heard about uh, autonomous driving cars and there is Alexa and Siri, all of that is machine learning. So, so the, the, the question is, uh, can we learn something about, uh, from history about what, what will the future bring? And uh, uh, at least on the science part. And one thing that I find interesting and usually not discussed is that uh, the idea of artificial intelligence, even before computers, starting with Turing, um, 
was really to imitate the brain, the human brain. Um, this somehow got lost uh, in the meantime, um, but it's a kind of a, the basis of this, uh, this, um, this explosion in the last five years of deep learning and the reinforcement learning. Uh, people don't often realize this, but both these algorithms that are the key part of successes like uh, AlphaGo, you know, this is the DeepMind system that uh, has won against uh, world champion of Go. There is actually a competition starting today in China. In China. Yeah, in China. Um, uh, the, 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 the key um, engine inside are these algorithms, uh, deep learning and, uh, and the reinforcement learning. And those are both inspired from neuroscience. It's actually, I don't think, an accident that Debbie Sasabis, who is the CEO of uh, DeepMind, which is part of Google, is actually a neuroscientist. He was a postdoc in my lab, um, and my lab has been always working between brains and computers. And by the way, Amnon Shashua was also a postdoc in my lab, so I was lucky um, to have great people there. But the point I want to make is that probably um, it's, it's possible that the next breakthrough will also borrow from neuroscience. I don't know exactly what. I can make some guesses, but uh, uh, we can discuss that later. Yes, well, look, that's it's a good point to stop on for the moment. Let's turn to uh, you, Jack. I know you uh, have uh, trained in neuroscience at the NIH, so we want to sink that your teeth into that too, but maybe give us a couple of thoughts. Um, bring us down from the 30,000 foot level into uh, something practical. Some applications, you know, yeah. yeah. Some applications. Yeah. Well, first, it's great to be here. Um, I was just in uh, Hebrew University just a few weeks ago on campus. Uh, seeing some of the great technology. Uh, you saw some of it earlier today. You'll see some more later today. So it's very exciting to be here with Tommy and Vijay, two of my good friends, uh, as well, in, in celebrating Hebrew University, celebrating the technology. Um, and also, by the way, I went to visit Mobileye as well, which Tommy serves on the board of, and obviously a great success for the state of Israel. Only in Israel can you have a company sold. Uh, Intel is the one who bought it. We heard from Intel earlier today. And everyone in Israel got an email after this transaction was announced, saying that because of the five billion, uh, roughly it's a $15 billion transaction, about a third of it goes as taxes to the state of Israel, because of that infusion of five billion, everyone's gonna get a discount on the taxes that they pay on their cell phones uh, in the state of Israel. So um, only in Israel can you see something like that. It's, it's fantastic. Um, and for, I should also say that I'm here speaking individually and personally, not uh, representing any company today, because I have some controversial views sometimes, so I want to make sure that's the case. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let me just kick off with a couple of just examples of applications. Um, one of the things the organizers asked us to do is to give a high-level view of what is AI, but also how do we actually use it in some areas. And I want to try to touch on that. So I'm going to focus mainly on healthcare. Before I do, though, I want to show some super advanced technology that very, very few people have seen in the application of AI and robotics. This is really advanced stuff that, that, again, very few people have had the opportunity to see. This is a robot that we have developed, um, which is able to wake you up in the morning with great precision. Um, it is gentle. It works with your REM sleep uh, cycles. Um, you can see the kind of uh, wonderful interaction that it has with the human. And then once you get awake, we have a precision surgical robot to serve you breakfast. Um, we're, we're in the testing phase on this. Uh, preparing for surgery in the operating theater. Um, we, we do have a company called Verb Surgical, which is robot assisted. And so this is where it started. Um, and you can see the precision. Uh, there's no spillage whatsoever. Um, so this is really the advanced state that we see ourselves right now uh, in, in AI. So hopefully that gives you a sense there. Um, and that's why, of course, it's now clear why there's so much investment going into AI, given that robotic advance. Um, but there is quite a bit of, of, of investment going in, and everyone here, I'm sure, has been aware of all that investment. Mobileye is a great example. Orcam, another company from Amnon Shashua and, and team at Hebrew U, uh, is focusing on a slightly different application, which is the application of AI uh, for the blind and visually impaired, uh, putting a camera on glasses, allowing you, uh, as a blind person or visually impaired person, to actually hear in your ear everything that you're seeing in terms of words. So um, I commend you to check out or CAM as well, but a lot of investment going in, and I just want to focus on a few ideas happening in healthcare right now. There's a tremendous amount of uh, healthcare investment going in in terms of AI-based uh, healthcare companies, and these are just a few of them. I'll highlight here 
uh, Babylon is one company based in London. Very impressive company, not only because the AI in this uh, particular app that you can download uh, from this, uh, from the app store right here in the US, even though it's mainly a, a UK focused company, it allows you, the patient, to triage on your own with the AI what exactly is wrong with you. And more interestingly, the NHS, the National Health Service of the United Kingdom, has adopted this and said for initially 500,000 people, and now they just announced about a week ago that 1.5 million UK citizens are now officially going to use this app and the triage, the AI triage, that is not a human, AI interaction, as their first line of triage for their NHS interaction. That is, instead of picking up a phone, dialing an 0800 number in the UK, and speaking to a nurse or nurse practitioner. That saves 20 pounds, 20 British pounds per call. The initial studies shown over the past three years of the 500,000 show that the results are more accurate and better and lead to better outcomes. And that's why the NHS has now adopted this, going from 500,000, tripling that to 1.5 million UK citizens. This is their official initial contact with NHS. So AI and healthcare is no longer just a figment of our imagination. It's no longer just a, something in the workbench or something in the, in the lab. This is now in the real world, in the wild, as we say. Um, and so you can check, check that out. And by the way, that's all natural language. You can speak in a very natural way to the AI. It understands you, understands your symptoms, and then both gives you a sense of what might be wrong, but also informs the GP, the doctor, what might be wrong. And then you get on a telemedicine video with the actual human doctor, for now, um, to actually find out what actually what you want to do about that. Here's another example of the application of AI in healthcare, but a different part. This is in drug discovery. So very often there are problems in pharmaceutical uh, drug discovery and drug development that are quite difficult. Sometimes we're looking for a certain target. Uh, we're looking to target a certain part of, the, uh, of a process in biology that we can stop a certain disease from progressing. Uh, cancer is a very good example of that. Uh, there's something called the MAP kinase pathway, as an example, uh, in every one of our cells. It instructs the cell when to divide, and of course, cancer is a problem of too much division of cells. And so uh, we're applying, in this case, Benevolent.ai is another company based in the UK, as it happens, uh, which is applying AI to drug discovery. They've been so successful that they actually have approached J&J, &J, Johnson & Johnson, and licensed a portfolio of compounds that J&J &J wrote off. J&J &J said, we don't know what to do with these initial compounds. We spent a few hundred million dollars on this set of compounds. We can't take them further. We don't have the tools to do that using traditional methods. Benevolent, using its AI platform, has been able to find new targets and new uses for those abandoned compounds. So this is real. This is happening both in the healthcare setting, the patient doctor setting, and it's also happening in the drug discovery setting. Um, and I just want to kind of, before we get to the big discussion, um, just touch upon another aspect of AI, both in terms of healthcare and other, um, uh, other implications. This is an example of a combination of human intelligence and AI. And I think we'll probably in the discussion get to this concept of, it's not all about just a human doing something or an AI do something. Very often we can have a combination. This is me sitting in that suit. I'm strapped in that suit right there. And instead of looking at virtual reality, I'm not looking at virtual reality, I'm looking through the eyes of my avatar robot. My avatar robot's sitting about 10 feet to my left there, and I look out the eyes, the cameras of that robot. My headphones are listening to the uh, microphones on my avatar. When my friend Harry shakes my robot hand, I feel it in my haptic sensors, in my sensors on my actual hand. And when I turned, Harry said, please turn to your right, Jack, and of course, my body is linked to my avatar body. I turn my physical body to my right. What did my avatar body do? It turned to its right, watching me. As much as I tried to, my locus of consciousness at that time was in my avatar, was in my robot, because we see where our consciousness sits kind of behind where we see. And so as much as I tried to, I tried to put myself back in my physical body, my locus of consciousness. I could not do it, nor could any of the 60 people we put through this experiment get themselves back into their physical body. Even when they touched me on the shoulder, my physical body on the shoulder, I could not get myself back in. So this avatar is not autonomous. It's not pure AI. It has some AI that helps uh, control it, but I am also controlling it. So it's a combination of human intelligence and artificial intelligence. 
allowing for new experiences. Imagine that we can use this in disaster relief. We can have these sent out, powered by humans, to lift heavy boulders and find humans buried in there uh, after a disaster or things like that. Many, many applications in healthcare, disaster relief, education, and other applications of this avatar technology. This is real, this happened, again, this is now coming. So it's not all about just HI or AI, often we can find combinations of that. And with that, let me turn back to Vijay, thank you. Great. Thank you, Jack. Um, actually, that fits very nicely with the theme for the day, hybrid solutions to global challenges. Um, I want to row it back a little bit, though. Um, uh, before we came on stage, uh, one of the people in the audience uh, challenged us a little bit to define our terms. Um, what is artificial intelligence, and what is it not? Uh, because it is a very fashionable term these days, right? Companies are rebranding whatever databases they had and uh, bits of algorithms as, as, as AI. Um, we went through the big data hype a few years ago. We all remember that as well, right? Everything was big data. Can you, as people who've thought deeply about this, about deep learning, can you tell us how do you briefly describe artificial intelligence today? Maybe Tommy, we'll turn to you. Yes, well, um, you know, artificial intelligence has been uh, uh, changing in terms of what is defining. Uh, back in the 70s or so, um, artificial intelligence was programming, really. It was expert systems, was a set of rules, if this, do that. And, uh, you know, they achieved some interesting results, for instance, medical diagnosis or so. But, but in a sense, was uh, having expensive programmers putting the intelligence in the programs. Now we are in the phase in which, with, with machine learning, we can have, uh, if we have a lot of labeled data, for instance, a lot of images and uh, something that says what is in the image, then we can train system that can recognize images pretty well. So now we have replaced expensive programmers with cheap labor labelers, you know, Amazon Turk or crew somewhere uh, in, in, the, in the globe. Um, it's not yet how humans learn, how children learn. So that's the next frontier. All of these are AI in the standard sense of the term. Um, you know, the present version of AI, what is now AI, is deep learning, which are systems modeled uh, loosely after cortex layers of neurons um, computing in a way that we don't completely understand, but very efficiently, um, things like image recognition, autonomous driving, um, performing medical diagnosis, and so on. Um, we are still not at the stage in which we can say a computer is intelligent as we are. That will be the next one. Do you broadly agree with that, Jack? And if you do, will you take us to what you think AI is not? Sure. Um, yeah, I think both Tommy and I agree first that uh, we're at the very beginning stage, early stage of what we think about AI. There's a lot more to come. This is the first inning of many, many innings to come. I would also say many of us here in this room are investors, venture investors, looking at either personal investments or for venture funds or for companies. At least 50% of the companies that I see, and I see about uh, 25 to uh, 40 companies a month uh, that call themselves AI in some form or, or manner, 50% I would not classify as AI. So again, we're, we're in a bit of a mini bubble only in the sense that, not that the underlying technology is not real, it's very real. But again, when something gets very hot and hyped, many companies want to attach themselves with that label and thus get that bump up or get the interest and things like that. And it's natural, it happens, we've seen it happen through many, many cycles. All of us in this room have been through many cycles. So one, I would say, just be cautious. And one distinction I would say along Tommy's lines is um, distinction between statistical techniques, um, which I don't classify as AI. There's a lot of really good data science techniques, which are very valid and good, and you can get really good results about, uh, from it. And it may be a great investment as a data science investment, but not as an artificial intelligence, which again gets more to um, this neuroscience-inspired modeling that allows us to do things that we could not do over the past 20, 30 years. And again, we are very, very early in this phase. That's very clarifying, but I wanna challenge you something, Jack, on something you said. You said this is the first inning. It's obviously a long ball game. 
AI's and we're going over time, by the way. Okay. Well, well, I was going to say AI um, has been trumpeted as the technology of the future for at least 30 years. I mean, yeah. even longer if you want to, you know, delve back in history. But so surely it's our, at least the third inning, right? Uh, and we've had hype cycles, booms and busts. Some of us in this room are, are have enough gray hairs as I now do to, to remember some of the earlier hype cycles. Or lost our hair. Or, or lost our hair. Exactly. So. Um, uh, can you help us understand what didn't work in the past, yeah. and why should we believe the two of you now? I'll say a few things, and then please, Tommy, add. Uh, you know, we always say every time there's yet another cycle, people ask, why is now different, right? Manish tana halayla hazeh, right? Um, so, so the, the end, <laughs> and, and this time again, watch for the buzz, watch for the overhype in some of the companies. But a few, a few factors are coming together, VJ, this time around. First, we have new platforms of computation. There is a battle royale happening as we speak. As we're in this room right now, companies like NVIDIA, which just made tremendous announcements two weeks ago at its conference in terms of new kinds of chips. If you look at the stock price of NVIDIA, if you have a chance later, if you want to see a shocker of a stock price curve, you can look at NVIDIA, uh, which started as a company making chips for gaming consoles, uh, GPUs as we call them, graphical processing units. And then suddenly we realize in our community that we can use this for artificial intelligence, for deep learning specifically. Um, and, and suddenly they have a whole new market and they've embraced that market in a huge way. Not to be left out, Intel, Google, and others are in that fray. And each one is making announcements literally by the week. Um, and it's wonderful to see this competition. Uh, Google put out a paper just about three weeks ago saying that the TPU, which is Google's chip, is better than the GPU of NVIDIA. And then NVIDIA shot back just last week with a paper saying, no, 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 you're looking at it wrong, Google. NVIDIA, our chip, is better than that chip. And that's good news. I'm really excited about that because what it tells me is there's real competition, there's really um, advancement, innovation happening, and that's all to our benefit. So that didn't happen in the last three cycles of hype around AI. We just didn't have. I built my first neural network in 1991, and in 1991, I had to by hand code everything. I had to order a special chip that I kind of helped design, even though I'm not a chip designer, and order that to NIH and install it myself in a PC. Imagine PCs at the time of 1991. We just didn't have the tool sets. And today, it's really a different ballgame. So it gives me hope that we are onto a new pathway. We're seeing some of the results in applications. But again, it's still early. Let's, uh, I want to come to the audience uh, for uh, a question or two. So uh, please think about a really good challenge for our, our experts on stage here. Um, but I want to come back to the question of uh, neuroscience. Um, uh, in a sense, because it links up to part of what you're saying. Part of your answer as to why this time is different is that, you know, the tools are better, right? Before we were working with uh, toothpicks, now we have very sophisticated, you, you, you fill in the blank, whatever the th sophisticated tool is. But I would put to you, uh, the bar has moved. That is, we're working on a more difficult challenge now. Before, what we called AI, as Tommy has explained, was something rather simplistic. Now, we're really trying to model the human brain and its workings. Uh, at least in, uh, some people in AI. Yeah, so are we trying to do something that's much harder now as well? And uh, doesn't that suggest that, in fact, we'll, we may be here 10 or 20 years from now saying we've, uh, AI will be with us tomorrow, if only we had better tools? Yeah, well, I think uh, you know, the problem of intelligence, I think, personally, is not only one of the great problems of science, like uh, understanding the origin of life or the origin of the universe or the structure of space and time, it's actually the greatest of all. So I think it would be a little bit uh, too ambitious or too silly to pretend that we can solve it in the space of a decade or two or five. Mm. It will be with us for some time. Um, I, you know, I, I, I think that uh, if we make any progress on that problem, this means that we can make ourselves smarter, make machines that help us think better, which is happening, and that so, therefore solves all other problems. So that's why I think it's the greatest problem of all, apart from the fact that it's really ultimately understanding how our mind works and uh, how to replicate it in machines. Can just, I, uh, just to uh, follow up on that. Yeah. Uh, Jack had talked about his experience with that uh, avatar when he couldn't get his 
consciousness, as it were, yeah. back into his physical yeah. body. Um, with your lifetime of working in this field of AI, how do you think about consciousness? Right. And do you think we will be able to achieve consciousness through artificial means? Well, that's a, you know, a very difficult question. <laughs> I, uh, I think we need to try. That's the best answer. I don't know. I think uh, um, you know, most of my colleagues, I would say 100% agree that we'll have intelligent machines at some point. Uh, Demi Sasabis, for instance, thinks that in 10, 20 years, we can replace an intelligent assistant, a secretary. Um, and, you know, it may be a, a little bit optimistic, but more or less, I agree with him. Factor two, maybe. But if you ask uh, my colleagues or me, you know, about consciousness, I think that's a different story. More, probably less than 50% think that machines could be conscious. Yeah, how do you uh, Let me just add a, yeah, a few items to that. Tommy and I were at a conference recently in Palo Alto that Tommy was chairing, and a paper was presented there around the history of neuroscience and AI and how they started together. They were born, as it were, um, somewhat together, neuro, uh, AI inspired by brain models. But then computer science departments rose up in academia, and AI went that way. Neuroscience stayed in the biology, neuro departments, and the two never spoke for the past 25 years. It's our hope, and I think the hope of more and more people, that we start getting those two disciplines talking with each other. Uh, going both ways, by the way, it's not just let's look to neuroscience and the brain for interesting structures and then try to replicate them with AI and make more powerful AI. I'd like to see us go the other way as well. And, and both Tommy and I think would like to see us model things and try things in the artificial space and then look for them. And the analogy I would give you is what happens in astrophysics. Astrophysics has both theoretical astrophysicists like Einstein was um, and the co-founder of Hebrew U, and he said, there's probably something called the gravity wave. He said that in 1920. And many years later, in 1970s, Ray Weiss, who will probably get the Nobel Prize in the next few years for this innovation, realized he could build an experimental machine to test that hypothesis. And 18 months ago, that machine was finalized, and we did detect gravity waves that Einstein predicted in 1920. That kind of interaction between the theoretical motivation and the experimental doesn't happen as much as needed, and it's very much needed in our field. And that's what we hope to really start driving. Starting to drive. Starting to Starting. drive. Good. Let's see. Uh, any questions? I see a quick hand here. I might just do a quick round robin, take a couple of questions, and uh, ask our panelists to respond. We have about five minutes. Let's come to the lady next. Well, the gentleman here first. Shai saying two questions with you. Yeah, two questions. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, please, please make them questions rather than long-winded statements. Could you speak about uh, the notion? Your name, sir. Your oh, name, sir. My, my name is uh, David Bach. Okay. I, I run a translational neuroscience company. Uh, could you speak about the future of the brain-computer interface as it applies to the question of intelligence? Uh, specifically, you know, the idea is that if you can combine a brain with a computer, you can in some ways make a, a being that's more intelligent than either, either one. Great. Hold that thought. Let's ask the lady's question, and then you can answer as you see fit with the minute remaining. Uh, Joan Price, New York City. Uh, thank you for this lucid conversation. Uh, you've thrown out some fantastic things, medical care, public transportation, self-driving cars. Could you throw out a few more? What are directions of AI that we didn't think of yet that you know about? Thank you. Presumably uh, for applications soon, for that applications practical. Applications okay, today, yeah. very good. What's going to be practical? Uh, Brain-computer interface, and then, you know, what can we see tangibly next? I'll leave it to you. Who wants to tackle the first? Okay, brain-computer interfaces. Um, well, I think it will happen. Um, there are um, a lot of practical problems right now in terms of um, um, how invasive this can be and, uh, you know, kind of silly problems about our immune system rejecting implants. Um, so it's a bit difficult to say. I don't think it will happen very soon. And we certainly don't know enough about the brain in order to, for instance, plug in an extra memory and interface it properly with our brain. Um, but there are a, a number of uh, initial steps in that direction. It's possible, for instance, and we did it uh, 10 years ago, to record from visual cortex in a monkey with electrodes and um, understand from 
from the neural activity what the monkey is looking at. And in a reverse sense, you can also write in, again, through the same electrodes, you can affect the perception that the monkey is getting from the, its eyes. So you're, you're um, uh, keeping a watching brief, but this doesn't sound like it's uh, in the near-term horizon. No. OK. Uh, and Jack, on the uh, opportunities sure. that haven't been mentioned. Um, well, first, just one, one comment on not brain computer interfaces specifically, but the idea of these things. Many people recoil at the idea that we're going to be sticking stuff in our head. And before you recoil and say that that's not going to happen because you, you just find it weird, let's remember that today, Parkinson's patients, 7,000 a year in the US, another 10,000 globally, are getting deep brain simulation, DBS. These are little devices made by Medtronics and others put into the SDN, the subthalamic nucleus, and stimulating and reducing tremors by 80 to 90 percent. Today, there are more than a million people with cochlear implants who otherwise could not hear and now can hear. So before we dismiss that this is never going to happen, today we interface with the brain. So um, this is going to keep a pace, and, and we're going to see some more developments there. On applications, um, yeah, people know about healthcare. Um, cybersecurity, obviously, um, given all the malware and viralware and all the stuff that you see coming out there, we, we have to use uh, machine learning, not just in terms of, oh, cracking that particular worm of virus, but also for the human side. You heard, about Daniel, you heard Daniel Kahneman speak today about the various biases and bugs that we have in our brain, and that's probably what leads to phishing, phishing with a PH, which allows us to be fooled into giving up our passwords. We can now start to model what might happen in terms of phishing scenarios and things like that. So cybersecurity is getting very, very sophisticated. Let me give you one that probably most people haven't thought of. And that is everyone is today hopefully wearing clothes in this room. Okay, good, yeah. Um, clothes today are made by hand. Um, there's no button. The button on Tommy's jacket, button on this jacket, was put on by a human being by hand using a sewing needle on there. Um, the stitches on my uh, jacket and pants were pushed through by a human being into a Singer-like sewing machine that goes back 100 years. All the clothing in this room, none of it was made by a machine. That will change very, very rapidly. There are 360 million humans on Earth today who are responsible for making all the clothing. That is going to be a very high impact sector as we get to machines for the first time ever that can make the clothing that we're wearing. OK, we're just out of time. Um, uh, one last question using the moderator's prerogative. What is the percentage of people in this room whose jobs you think will be wiped out by AI? <laughs> In the next 10 years, 10 years. I'll give you a 10-year horizon. Not in the next day. Not tomorrow. Okay. 10 years from now. Yeah, I want each of you to give a percentage, 0 to 100. Yeah. Um, in this room, thankfully, I think most people here, only about 30% about of your jobs will be absolutely uh, wiped away. Um, for, the, for the general population at large, unfortunately, uh, I'm a bit uh, pessimistic or aggressive on AI, if you want to call it mm -hmm. that way. I believe actually more like 55% uh, of jobs will be wiped away over the next 10, 10 15 years. So. Yes. Tommy, what would be your answer? Uh, I think 0%, but you, you all will have to work much less. <laughs> <laughs> OK, well, that sounds all right to me. So please give them a nice round of applause for being good sports. Thank you.